He was reincarnated into a fantasy world but ends up raising the goddess to be her wife and becomes the strongest SS rank adventurer after creating a harem. Kelvin was an absolute loser who ends up getting eliminated by Truck Kun but is given another chance at life in an alternate world by a goddess named Melfina. He is dropped down into an empty forest where he finally wakes up beneath the tree not remembering anything about his past life. He gets confused about who he is and where he is when a small menu appears in front of him and starts talking. The voice explains that he has been reincarnated into the world of magic and fantasy where he can become an adventurer if he wants. He checks his stats on the menu to find out that he has chosen a support class for himself and he is a summoner. He seems to be pretty happy about this and decides to go to the nearest town in order to join a guild to start adventuring. While walking through the forest, the menu screen reveals that she is actually the goddess named Mel herself. They enter the bustling town where Mel tells him about his lost memory by claiming that after dying he ended up choosing a lot of abilities and alongside that he was able to riz Mel herself as well and she decided to join him in this adventure. He asks why can't he see her, and she replies that he doesn't have enough mana points to do that. He then enters one of the guilds and one of the receptionists gives him a form to fill. While filling his abilities as a summoner, he is stopped by Mel who tells him not to do so, as the summoner class is extremely rare, and he is probably the only summoner in this entire kingdom. If this news is revealed he might have to face trouble. He decides to put his abilities as a mage and soon receives his guild card. It denotes that he is an F-ranked adventurer as of now and the receptionist claims that he needs to complete 10 quests if he wants to upgrade his rank. After that the receptionist shows him a bunch of quests, and he decides to go after the slimes in the forest as he can try his summoning spells on them. Before that, he buys an old wooden wand with all of his remaining money and leaves for the forest to earn some money. After walking for a bit he finally spots some slime and immediately hides in some bushes. He checks their stats and realizes that they are pretty weak, so he decides to not use his magic and simply weaken them by physical attacks. He jumps out and attacks the slime with his staff but the slimes dodge away while one of them hits him in the chest, throwing him back. Kelvin gets up once again and rushes in for an attack, but the slime dodges and counter-attacks him three times in a row, knocking him down to the ground. Kelvin gets up one last time and goes in for an all-out attack, swinging his staff, but the slime dodges again. Thankfully, this time, Kelvin immediately hits it with a second attack that knocks the slime to the ground leaving it with almost no HP. Kelvin walks towards it and extends his arms and the magic activates and the contract is made. After that he summons the slime and names it Clo before claiming that they are going to hunt some more slimes now. In the evening they finally find a group of slimes and creep towards them through a bush. Kelvin tells Clo to take care of the right one while he deals with the other. Soon they jump out of the bushes and Kelvin immediately uses his wind magic to slash through the slime, while Clo does some fancy boxing moves before eliminating his opponent. Kelvin is confused because Clo seems to be extremely powerful and checks the menu to realize that even at level 1 it has amazing stats. Mel reveals that this is because he is the only SS rank summoner in this world and that's why his monsters are so powerful. While they were talking, Clo finds another slimes and beats it to the ground before Kelvin calls him back to his poke ball. After reaching the town he sells the core of the slimes for some profit and has enough money to get some food and a place to stay for the night. While crossing through an alleyway he sees a bunch of caged and inside of it some beautiful girls with slave collars on them. One of them is supposed to be a very rare half-elf who was caught recently. He decides to ignore this and simply walks by into an inn and gets a room for the night. Soon he goes down to have some dinner and his life in this world starts to take shape. He goes on some more adventures, fighting against a bunch of wolves, monsters, and other demons, ready to become the strongest adventurer alive. It has been some days since Kelvin has been adventuring and finally he has completed his 10th quest so he goes into the guild and is upgraded to an E-rank adventurer, which seems to make a lot of people jealous. Regardless, Kelvin asks for a high-ranking job but before the receptionist can answer, a blonde-haired dude named Cash tells him that he should take out the Black Knight. He tells him that he is a D-rank adventurer and wants Kelvin to join his party. Kelvin looks at his stats and realizes that he is lying about his rank. He declines the offer and instead claims that they should have a competition about who can defeat the Black Knight first. Cash seems to be surprised at this, but agrees to it regardless before walking out the guild. Kelvin believes that Cash might set up a trap but decides to go in anyway so that he can test how strong he is. Cash goes out into an alleyway and meets up with his teammates including a blue-haired nerd and a big fat brute. The brute tells Cash that he simply wants to beat someone to a pulp and with an evil smile Cash tells him not to worry as he has already found a victim. 
After reaching the Black Knight's castle, Cash and his cronies run inside but as soon as they open the door, they find that all the monsters have already been killed. Suddenly Kelvin appears from the shadows and tells them that they are late. He claims that the Black Knight is behind the doorway but to get to him, they will have to fight Kelvin. Cash seems to be surprised by this turn of events but before he could think of anything, Kelvin provokes the Brute by calling him a fat loser who has never seen a girl. This enraged the Brute who rushes forward. But Kelvin uses his magic to turn the ground into quicksand which traps the fatty inside of it. Following that, Kelvin uses his wind slashes at them but the fatty blocks it while the others barely dodge it. This freaks the nerd out who starts running away. But Kelvin immediately summons Klo to stop him who has turned into a huge monster that chases the nerd back into the hall. While Kelvin was adventuring a couple days ago, Klo started acting weird, and soon enough evolved into a giant slime monster that Mel claims to be one of the strongest summons alive as it has the power to destroy an entire country on its own. Back in the present, Klo smacks the nerd into a wall and knocks him out. Seeing this the fatty uses his entire strength to get out of the mud, but is immediately grabbed by Klo while Cash rushes towards Kelvin to attack him. Kelvin beats the crap out of them and with Klo's help, ties them up with some rope. After that, he opens the door behind him only to find a very cool-looking armored knight with a giant sword. Kelvin moves forward and decides that he is going to capture the knight instead of defeating it. The knight however refuses to fight and they sit down to have a conversation as the knight tells him about his story of serving different kings, and even gives him a very old piece of candy. Kelvin cuts to the chase, and asks him whether he would be willing to form a contract with him, and the knight replies that he has nothing better to do so he will agree only if Kelvin can defeat him in combat. The knight falls, and the battle begins. Kelvin runs at the knight and uses his wind slashes but they have no effect while Klo tries to attack him from behind. The knight easily grabs Klo and stops it from attacking while Kelvin runs at him and uses earth magic to create a distraction for Klo to escape. Soon the knight uses an aerial slash that Kelvin barely dodges before he himself uses an earth splitter that has no effect on the knight. The knight uses another air slash that Kelvin dodges while Klo engages him in a massive clash, totally distracting him and giving Kelvin the opportunity to use a trap. He uses a special magic that creates increased gravity around the knight and he is forced to the ground. Kelvin thinks that he won the battle, but the knight knocks off his magic before rushing towards him, and delivering very strong slashes that Kelvin barely manages to dodge by using his earth magic. The knight closes the distance incredibly quickly and tries to finish the job but Kelvin uses his gravity spell once again, slowing the knight down, while Klo appears in front of him and uses his solar beam to blast him away. The next morning, Kelvin goes inside the guild carrying the broken helm of the Black Knight that gets a lot of praise, as he also captured Cash, and his gang red-handed who are now put in prison for their crimes. He later climbs the stairs towards his room and it is revealed that he was successfully able to forge a contract with the Dark Knight as well. He moves towards his room to get some much-deserved rest when he suddenly notices an old man who seems to be waiting for him. The old man introduces himself as Leo T. Guildmaster and without wasting a single moment, straight up asks Kelvin whether he is from another world or not. This shocks Kelvin who immediately checks his stats to find out that Leo is pretty high ranked and can probably see who he actually is. They sit down for some tea while Leo tells Kelvin that the receptionist told him that not only did he capture Cash and his gang red-handed, but he also defeated the Black Knight alone. He then tells Kelvin that he knows that Kelvin is a summoner. He is shocked once again and thinks whether he can lie about his identity, but both Mel and the Knight tell him that he can't stay hidden forever. This gives him some confidence and he calmly reveals that indeed he is the summoner as it is no point hiding it any further. He then questions Leo in return claiming that he should have been able to figure out that Cash and his gang were criminals. So why didn't he stop them? He calmly replies that Cash belongs to a noble family of a neighboring kingdom, and that's why he was out of his jurisdiction without any hard evidence. Leo then tells Kelvin to rest easy as he is not here to be his enemy, and would rather be his friend. Leo reveals that he has met people from another world before as well, and some of them are the heroes of a neighboring kingdom. Mel suddenly remembers about reincarnating them as well and promises to give the details to him later. Leo claims that there was a prophecy recently and it was said that the Demon King is going to be revived soon and that is the reason why the monsters around the area are growing so violent and strong. He tells Kelvin that he wants him to defend the city against the common monsters while the heroes deal with the Demon King himself. Kelvin asks what he will get in return and Leo replies that he will increase his adventurer's rank personally, 
and he will be free to take any jobs he wants. Moreover, they will provide as much support as they can and apart from that he will never reveal his secret to anyone and provide him complete freedom. He agrees to the arrangement and is immediately ranked up to a B-grade adventurer. He goes back to the inn and gets some lunch before asking Mel about the story of the heroes that were reincarnated before him. Mel informs him that not long ago Truck Kun decided to strike and deleted four more guys and girls from Japan so she decided to reincarnate them into this world as heroes that will fight against the Demon King. Soon after he finishes his lunch and takes out the money he saved before going outside. Mel asks what is he planning to do with so much money and he excitedly replies that he is going to buy a slave. He walks past the same street and notices all the cages assembled there just like before when suddenly a man rushes past him completely covered in flames, while the trader quickly put out the flames. The man seemed to be a customer who gets mad at the trader and leaves. The trader explosions that one of her slaves seems to have a curse that burns anyone that touches her, and when Kelvin looks past him he is shocked to see that it is none other than the half-elf girl. He checks her stats and decides to buy her from the slaver. The trader seems to be shocked at this, and tells him again that she has a curse, but Kelvin doesn't care and gives him the money before taking her out. The girl seems to be scared and inbounds but starts following him regardless. Some time later, he turns around and tries to touch her but the girl backs off, claiming that she has a curse and that she doesn't want to hurt anyone. Kelvin calmly tells her not to worry, and gently touches her head before using his SS rank magic to dispel the curse that was placed upon her. The girl is shocked to know that she is not cursed anymore and breaks down into tears, thanking Kelvin for this kindness and introduces herself as Ethel who was sold into slavery as soon as she was born. He tells her not to worry as now he will keep her safe and takes her back to the inn before asking the cute fat lady to make them some food. The lady seems to be skeptical about the girl but when Kelvin tells her that she is a slave that he brought, she takes her into the bathroom with her to thoroughly clean her, while Kelvin waits at the table for some food. After some time the lady returns back with Ethel who is now dressed in a maid's outfit. They have their dinner and return back to the room where Kelvion explains everything to her and shows her his other summons. They check her stats and upgrade her levels and soon the night falls and they all decide to get some well-deserved sleep for the adventures tomorrow. It has been a couple of months since Kelvin started adventuring and now they are able to work in a much more coordinated fashion. Ethel ended up maxing out her archery skills, and alongside her flame magic, she is able to deliver lethal blows to enemies with a single strike, which helps their team a lot as Kelvin, Chloe and Greer the Knight all use melee weapons and she is the only one who could use ranged attacks. After taking care of a monstrous tree, they return back to the guild where the receptionist congratulates them as after only one quest, Kelvin will be raised to an ranked adventurer while Ethel can get her B-rank card. She tells them to get ready for the exam but tells Ethel not to worry as the last time when she gave the exam. She used her invisibility and was easily able to defeat the instructor to gain her C-rank card. While there, the receptionist named Ange ends up inviting both him and Ethel to a sweet shop that just opened and they agree to it. The next morning they go down to the market and seem to be having a good time, tasting sweets when suddenly a group of rowdy nobles arrive and kick their table away. Kelvin asks what the hell is their problem and one of the cronies yells that he is standing in front of the third prince of the neighboring country. The fat fucking prince decides to shit talk Kelvin and tells him to hand over the girls for a day or two if he wants forgiveness. Enraged by this Kelvin moves forward and blasts away one of the purple haired crony into the wall, terrifying the fatty before doing the same to the other guy, leaving the ugly bastard alone. He then moves towards the prince and uses his gravity magic to bind him in place while asking him what he is doing in this country. The prince refuses to answer which leads to him getting forced to the ground even more. Soon the fat ugly guy spits the information, saying that he is here to meet with the guildmaster named Leo as he heard that there is a new adventurer who is extremely strong and is currently using this guild as his base. He claims that he wants the adventurer to serve him so that he can win some glory and be seen as someone worthy for the throne. Kelvin tells him that he is the adventurer and he will never work for someone as pathetic and fat as him. Following that they return back to the guild to get some sleep. The next morning Mel tells them some news as she recently got information about what the heroes have been doing and she gives Kelvin the stats to check them out. Kelvin remarks that the heroes seem to be severely underleveled, considering that they were reincarnated a year ago. Mel tells him that this can be problematic as the demon lord might get revived soon and the heroes are not nearly strong enough to take him on. Compared to them, Kelvin and his party have only been here for a little more than a month, but they are already much stronger and have advanced weaponry as well. 
While they were checking out their weapons, the Lady of the Inn knocks their door and tells Kelvin that Leo wanted to talk to him. Kelvin goes over to the guild where Leo tells him that recently a bunch of adventurers found a secret room inside of a D-rank cave, and the secret room seemed to house an extremely strong demon that can be S-rank. This shocks Kelvin as he has never fought against such a strong opponent but there is no one in this guild who can take this challenge head on so he accepts the quest. Later that day, Kelvin and his party finally arrive at the location only to find Erd, the instructor who took Ethel's exam standing there. He greets them and asks whether they are here to solve the quest and Kelvin asks about any developments. Erd honestly reveals that they have no idea how strong this demon might be so he has created a protective barrier around the cave so that no one gets accidentally hurt. He leads them into a small shack that has a trap door from where Kelvin and his party descend downstairs. They walk through the dark and dingy caves that look very scary but surprisingly enough he doesn't seem to feel the presence of any life forms in the area. They keep walking before reaching a huge gate where Kelvin tells them to stop because now he can feel the presence of not only one but two demons inside the room. They all get ready and open the giant door to see a room full of skulls with no lights. They keep moving forward when they suddenly notice a demonic girl bound on top of an altar. This surprises Kelvin but before he could think of anything, a voice is heard behind them and they turn around to see a demon who introduces himself as Archdemon Victor. A chill goes down Kelvin's back as he realizes that this demon is definitely S-rank but he maintains his composure and asks him who the girl is. Victor simply closes the door shut and the room lights up completely. He then claims that the girl on the altar is the daughter of the previous demon lord. This is very shocking news as even Mel didn't know that the last demon lord had a daughter. Victor continues that he killed every single monster in this area so that any human can easily reach this room and without any further talk, attacks Kelvin head on. Thankfully, Gerard blocks the hit with his shield but is pushed back because of his overwhelming power. Kelvin immediately uses his gravity spell to hold him in place and asks what he wants from them. Victor reveals that he has a seal placed on him and only humans can remove the seal. Once his seal is removed, he will devour the daughter of the Demon King and become the strongest demon alive and the next demon lord. With that he breaks free of the gravity spell and gets ready to kill Kelvin and his party but instead of being scared, Kelvin is overflowing with excitement, as he has never faced such a strong enemy before. Victor is confused to see that Kelvin seems excited rather than scared so he uses a black magic spell and creates a bunch of undead monsters that rise up from the skulls and attack our heroes. Kelvin immediately uses his wind slash to deal with these monsters while Gerard smacks them left and right with his sword but tells Kelvin that their numbers could be a problem if they are not careful. After that he uses his special aerial slash to delete a bunch of monsters, but they seem to be multiplying faster than Indians as they keep attacking our heroes while they destroy them one by one. Victor seems to be pretty surprised and impressed by their performance as they attack in perfect synergy. Kelvin walks towards him and asks whether he would like to fight now, and hearing this Victor simply laughs and punches the ground to create a smoke cloud covering everything. Kelvin tells Gerard to calm down as the demon seems to be underground and as soon as he tries to attack, Gerard is able to block it with his shield, shocking Victor. Gerard follows up with another attack, but Victor escapes before attacking Kelvin who dodges the strike. Victor again appears in front of the Black Knight and they engage in a fierce duel but by the end of it, Victor is able to overpower him and blows him away. Kelvin gets a little worried but before he could think, one of the demon hands attack him and he is forced to block and dodge out of the way. Before he can regain his balance, Victor appears behind him and tries to attack but thankfully, Klo appears and blocks the attack, saving Kelvin's life. Surprised by the appearance of a new summon, Victor tries to blow Klo away, but he dodges out of the way, while Kelvin uses this distraction to apply a binding magic on the demon, holding one of his hands. Gerard runs up to him and is ready to attack but Kelvin stops him just as Victor uses his strength to break through the binds. Kelvin immediately applies a magic buff to Gerard's sword and tells him to attack, but Victor merely smiles as his hand is already behind Kelvin, ready to attack. Kelvin suddenly tells Ethel to reveal herself and to Victor's shock, she appears right behind him with a fully charged arrow and shoots it. Victor is somehow able to bring back his hand and blocks the hit, taking an insane amount of damage, while Gerard uses this distraction to strike and chops away one of his arms. Kelvin tells everyone to back off, as the demon starts laughing maniacally and claims that he is going to take his final form, 
and soon his body starts transforming into a huge demon. Kelvin quickly tries to finish him off before he could transform and uses an earth splitter alongside a flaming arrow and Gerard's aerial slashes, but they are a bit too late as Victor transforms into his final form, and his armor easily blocks the damage. Victor immediately rushes towards the party while Kelvin creates a wall which is easily broken but Gerard intercepts the attack at the last moment and uses all of his strength to push him back. This doesn't seem to be enough as the demon quickly overpowers him and beats him to the ground and gets ready to deliver the final blow but is shot at by Ethel who distracts him with a constant barrage of arrows, giving Gerard an opportunity to get back on his feet and attack Victor. Gerard unleashes a huge combo of sword slashes but Victor is surprisingly quick and is able to dodge and block all of them. Suddenly Ethel starts shooting at him once again and while he was busy dealing with her, Chloe appears in front of him and shoots a buttload of cursed swords at him that push him down. Kelvin takes advantage of this situation and uses one of his most powerful spells accompanied by Ethel's blazing arrows and Chloe's solar beam. This combination of magic hits him square on the chest and he is blasted into the wall which creates a huge tremor and some part of the roof starts collapsing on them. To Kelvin's surprise, V. Eichter uses his body to block one of the huge boulders that was going to fall over the Demon King's daughter and after that he collapses on the ground, utterly defeated. Kelvin walks up to him and asks why the hell did he try to save the girl and finally he reveals the truth. He explains that he was one of the most trusted follower of the previous demon lord and was tasked to keep the existence of his daughter a secret as it might put her in danger from the heroes or some other enemies. Victor taught her how to fight, how to read and everything else in this very castle which is now a dungeon. Sadly, the day of reckoning came and the humans arrived with the heroes, completely outnumbering the demons. Knowing that there was no way to escape this, the demon lord gave him one final task of making sure that his daughter survives and put a seal on her which can only be broken by a kind-hearted human. While taking his last breath, Victor requests Kelvin to take the girl into her party and show her the world, as all she has ever seen is death and destruction. After uttering these final words, he passes away, while Kelvin walk up to the altar and breaks the seal that brings the girl out of her coma. She seems to know what was happening and immediately starts crying while Kelvin tries his best to comfort her. After a while, they all walk out of the dungeon to find Erd waiting for them. He asks what happened inside and Kelvin lies that the girl on his back was possessed by a demon but they were able to slay the demon and save her. He then gives him a piece of Victor's armor and tells him that this is the proof that they killed the demon and with that they quickly move out from the area to sit atop a mountain. He knows that if anyone gets to know that not only is this girl a demon, but the daughter of the demon lord herself, it could be a huge problem. She seems to have calmed down by now, and introduces herself as Sira. She asks whether he is sure that he wants a demon in his party but Kelvin obviously can't pass a chance of creating a harem and tapping some demon ass. She claims that it is incredibly impressive that he was able to defeat Victor who was one of the strongest demons in his time and asks who exactly is he. Kelvin replies that he isn't any hero, but just a common adventurer who enjoys battle. After that he asks whether she is ready to go with him but she is a little scared as she has never left the mansion before let alone visit a town. Thankfully Ethel and the others comfort her and explain how amazing it is going to be and soon she is ready to come with them. They travel back to the town and everything that Sira sees is new to her. She gets excited about every small thing, including fruit sellers, merchants, blacksmiths and even fountains. Kelvin tells Ethel to take care of her while he goes back to the guild. As soon as he opens the door he finds a party organized by Ange waiting for him as he has been promoted to an arranked adventurer. They all drink and eat late into the night after which they all crash into a dreamless sleep, waiting for their next adventure. Some days have passed since they found Sira and finally she has warmed up to them. To increase their team's performance, Kelvin learnt the art of blacksmithing and created some amazing armor and bracers for Sira, a new sword for Gerard, and a secret item for Ethel. He seems to be tired of all the work and decides to lay down when he suddenly remembers that ever since he came here, all that he has eaten is bread, and not a single grain of rice. He immediately decides that he needs to find a place where rice is grown and after a couple of days of research, they get ready for a journey to a kingdom called Toraj. They travel on a horse cart which is a first for Sira who still gets excited over every little thing that she sees, including the river and the boat. Suddenly the cart stops as a bunch of thieves ambush them. A blue-haired Karen who seems to be the leader of this pack claims tells the driver to stop moving if he cares for his life, while she spots both Ethel 
and Sira inside the cart. Kelvin asks the driver whether he knows about this group and he replies that this group lives in the Toraj region and are a famous band of thieves. Kelvin quickly checks their stats only to be disappointed by their levels that is below 30. He tells Sira that she can play with them if she wants but tells her that she can't use her bracers as it would be too overpowering. She gets disappointed but still moves out alone which surprises the thieves but the Karen simply laughs at her and tells her underlings to not hurt the girls as the boss would want them fresh. One of the guys move forward but is blasted away just by a tiny punch. This shocks the pack of thieves but Karen takes some copium and tells the others that it was just a fluke. The other guys attack her in tandem but get blasted away in a similar fashion while the big brute tries to crush her with a massive hammer. But to their surprise, Sira simply stops the hammer with one hand and after a while tips it towards the brute who falls to the ground pinned by his own hammer. After that Sira ties them all up with some rope but Karen can't keep her mouth shut and like the classic blue-haired feminist, starts screaming at them that her boss is level 70 and will make them pay with their lives. Kelvin and Sira are unfazed by it and tell her that Sira herself is level 75 which scares Karen off and she finally shuts up. After that they finally arrive into the kingdom and Kelvin realizes that it looks like an older version of Japan. They wander around the area and both Ethel and Sira witness the sea for the first time in their lives. After that they move straight to the Adventurer's Guild where an old lady welcomes them and claims that Leo has told her all about them. She claims that she used to be on the same party with Leo at one time as well. This makes Kelvin trust her more and he tells her about the thieves that they caught. The lady takes this seriously and tells them that this group is known as the Black Wind who were once defeated by some ranked adventurers who are now treated as national heroes. According to her information, now these heroes decided to take control of the group themselves and use it as a front for slave trade. Ethel claims that they should immediately find these people and catch them but the lady claims that it is not that easy as if they catch the national heroes. This could result in enmity between the government of Toraj and the government of Parth where they are from. Kelvin thinks about it when he suddenly feels the presence of some people coming through the front gate of the city, and his suspicions are confirmed after he spots the hero and their party walking into the city. He tells the guildmaster that if the hero's party took down this gang of thieves, then the public cannot be disappointed and the heroes do not belong to any one government so there would be no problems in that regard. The guildmaster agrees with this suggestion and invites the heroes into the guild before explaining the situation to them. Meanwhile, Kelvin and his party goes into the hideout of the thieves and kick open the door, knocking one of the thieves out, only to find a joker-looking dude harassing some women. Before he can react, Gerard shoves him into the wall knocking him out. They then move forward and open the door of the room where the leaders are and immediately a clash happens. The leader of the group thinks that he is on the same level as them, but Kelvin soon tells him that beating his entire party is easier than washing dishes before unleashing a magic attack. Meanwhile, the hero's party enters the dungeon and starts walking through the corridors trying to find the slaves. They come across a door and open it to find Clo in front of all the slaves. The guy immediately takes out his sword but one of the slave girls runs up in front of the slime and tells the hero that this slime belongs to the adventurers who saved them. They are still on the edge but the girl's mom explains that some ranked adventurers came before and they were able to liberate them before going further and to deal with the leaders. Before going, they left the slime behind to make sure that the slaves are safe. After that the woman tells the heroes that they should quickly go behind them as the leaders are veteran warriors and the ranked adventurers won't be able to deal with them alone. The hero and his party immediately rushes out of the room into the hallway to finally find another door. They burst into the room only to find the actual gang leaders on the floor, but they mistakenly believe that they were the ranked adventurers. After that they enter another room only to find Kelvin and his party sitting in a very villainous pose waiting for them. Kelvin keeps acting evil and tells the hero named Toya that the ranked adventurers were no match against him and they were crying like a bitch when he was beating them and he didn't even have to try at all. Toya immediately takes out his sword, followed by the other girls in his group while Kelvin laughs at them before standing up and claiming that he wants to propose a challenge. Whoever wins the challenge will do whatever the winner tells them to do, and because the hero's party shares a single brain cell amongst them, they agree to this. He tells them that he will be fighting them all at once alone and they can use whatever way they want to try and defeat him. At first Toya tells him that he can't fight like that as it is dishonorable, but the girls in his team knock some sense into him by claiming that Kelvin looks like a strong opponent, and they shouldn't take chances. Meanwhile, Kelvin goes back to his party and explains his plan which is to use the heroes to testify against Kristoff and his gang of thieves so that the people of this kingdom have no option but to believe them. 
Moreover, he really wants to fight the hero's party to see how strong they are and also so he can use his new secret equipment. The hero's party psychs themselves up and get ready to fight. They all release their special skills and rush towards Kelvin assuming that he is a caster and won't be able to fight in close combat. Kelvin however is much stronger and simply uses energy blasts aimed at them that stops Toya and one of his companions on the spot. The long-haired girl tries to use an aerial slash but Kelvin immediately dodges, only to be attacked by the tamer of their party who has a dragon in her backpack. The dragon shoots flames at him but he immediately uses a speed buff on himself and escapes the attack range. He quickly appears behind the white-haired cutie and touches her from behind, using his special armor and skill named Skill Eater that lets him copy anyone's skills just by touching them. He is able to steal the cutie's special skill as she falls to the ground unconscious. Toya quickly runs at him with an attack but Kelvin immediately dodges and falls back. The girls quickly start healing the cutie while Toya pursues Kelvin and keeps slashing at him again and again only to be blocked. Kelvin soon realizes that Toya's sword skills are higher than him, and soon enough, a part of his wand breaks off when it clashes with Toya's sword. Toya pursues after him while he simply punches his sword away. This shocks him but he keeps attacking with his sword while Kelvin simply uses his bare hands to block the blows and push him back. The girls are beyond surprised as Toya has s rank sword skills and still Kelvin is able to fight him without any weapons. Soon enough, the long-haired girl named Satsuna decides to help him but Toya simply dodges the blow and backs off while creating a huge earth wall in front of him. Satsuna uses her special skill which lets her cut through anything in front of her and the wall is cleanly sliced into two. Before she could regain her balance, Kelvin charges up a huge blast and uses it towards her but the blast is blocked by Toya who takes a lot of damage, but saves Setsuna. His party members seem to be worried about him, but he gets up once again only to get slapped by Setsuna who tells him to think about himself as well. This makes things very awkward for Kelvin as he just stands there and waits while the girls give Toya a pep talk about how they are all a team and the only way they can move forward is if they work together. Kelvin asks whether they are done with their chit chat as he is getting pretty bored. The heroes are finally ready to fight with a newfound camaraderie when suddenly someone throws a flashbang at him, completely blinding him. The tamer Nana immediately uses her ice magic to try and freeze Kelvin, while the cutie uses her gravity magic to stop Kelvin in his place. Meanwhile, both Toya and Setsuna rush towards him with their swords drawn which forces Kelvin to use an explosion magic to create some space between them. Toya and Setsuna get up from the ground and look over to see Kelvin appear out of the dust, completely unharmed. He tells them that it was a good display of coordination before turning towards Nana and Cutie. He tells them that after they cast their binding spells, they should have followed it up with some offensive spells which would have made it much harder to escape and respond to Toya and Setsuna's attacks. He then tells Setsuna that her attacks are way too easy to read and that she should try not to think too much before making a move. This makes Toya really mad who decides to use his special power, and his sword suddenly splits into two. He starts swinging the swords around like a total buffoon but his teammates are equally dumb and think that he is heroic. Setsuna gets ready for an attack as well, but this time, Nana attacks first with her most powerful ice magic that creates a bunch of icicles below Kelvin and he is stuck because of all the ice on top, unable to move very freely. Meanwhile, the cutie also decides to chip in and uses her magic to create a huge golem that charges a magic blast and shoots it at Kelvin. He realizes that this is getting interesting, so he creates a couple of golems of his own that block the attack, while he tells them to buy him some time. He immediately starts creating a bunch of magic circles around him all at once, that scare and confuse the heroes but soon enough the cutie realizes that he is trying to think of an extremely powerful attack that can free him from the frozen icicles. Setsuna immediately jumps into action, slicing through the golems and heading towards Kelvin, but before she could reach him, he is able to use this new spell that creates a large number of very powerful blasts that totally destroy the icicles, freeing him. Setsuin backs off but decides that she can't let him get the upper hand and thrusts herself once again into combat. But Kelvin is simply faster than her, and before she could hit him, he punches her in the stomach, knocking her down. Suddenly, Cutie's ogre starts attacking him and he realizes that the best way to destroy is to aim for the caster, so he jumps up in the air and knocks the cutie down as well, destroying the ogre completely. Watching this, Nana takes to the air on her baby dragon and uses an ice magic to cover herself in an icy crystal. 
but before she could reach him, Kelvin simply uses the binding magic he used against Victor, and Nana immediately is unable to move and falls of the sky like a dead fly. Toya is able to catch her before putting her down and turning his attention towards Kelvin. He is enraged and starts wildly swinging at him while Kelvin is able to cleanly block his attack again and again and just as Toya starts charging for a massive strike, Kelvin cleanly bypasses his defense and uppercuts him, knocking him out as well. Sometimes later, Toya wakes up from his slumber and immediately looks around to see his teammates looking at him worriedly while Kelvin sits alongside the slave girl. At first he immediately looks for his sword, but then he spots Chloe sitting on the girl's lap. Confused as heck he asks what is happening, and Kelvin finally reveals that he is just an adventurer and his party saved the slave girls before they came. Toya asks why they had to fight then, but suddenly remembers that while they were fighting, Kelvin kept telling him what they were doing wrong and was probably trying to train them. Toya immediately apologizes and bows down, begging Kelvin to teach him some more about how to fight more efficiently in a party. The next morning, Kelvin meets up with the guildmaster who thanks him for capturing the Black Wind Thieves and claims that they are all rotting in a dungeon right now. She asks whether he would be staying in this city for longer, but Kelvin replies that he will probably leave soon after relaxing a bit. After that, Kelvin, his party, and the heroes go into a small cave by the seaside, where Toya and his party fight against a giant squid monster as an exercise while Kelvin tells them their flaws as a party and as individuals. He guides them through the fight and soon enough the squid is dead on the floor. After that they all sit down on the picnic laid out by Ethel, and they all start eating while Toya tells Kelvin about how he got incarnated into this world. According to him, he was chilling with his friends in the classroom when suddenly everything started glowing and suddenly they met a goddess named Mel who reincarnated them into this world. They woke up in a cathedral in front of a priestess who has been guiding them ever since. Toya tells them that they need to be careful about themselves first and foremost and have to make sure that they are not mindlessly running into danger just because they want to save someone. Toya apologizes for his behavior and claims that there has been many times where he has put his team in danger just because of his hero's complex. Suddenly Sira comes back and claims that she caught a huge fish, but when she pulls it out from the water, it turns out to be an S-rank water dragon. Sira immediately starts beating it with her punches, almost playfully, while Toya and her party are shocked as hell to see someone fighting against an S-ranked monster without even breaking a sweat. Later that day, Toya and his party bid farewell where Kelvin gives them a pendant each that he created himself as a good luck charm. After that the heroes board a ship and move away from the shore while Kelvin and Gerard watch them. Kelvin turns around and tells Gerard that he plans to spend some more time adventuring on this continent, and he seems to agree with this notion. While talking, suddenly a messenger arrives with the message that the Queen of Torej has requested their presence in her court, and they immediately rush to the castle. Kelvin is shocked to see the scale of the castle and the fact that it is ancient Japanese architecture. Gerard claims that he heard that the first emperor of this region was also a man who was summoned here as a hero from another world and he brought pieces of his tradition and transformed this region. They finally enter the castle and after taking off their shoes they all bow down in front of the queen who tells them not to worry about the formalities and thanks them for their help with the capture of the Black Wind Thief Gang. She tells them that normally she would have organized a huge public ceremony to honor them as heroes but considering that they are form parth, it could create some issues with the people living here. She then asks Kelvin to ask for anything he wants as a prize for the work he has done and if it is under her power, she will grant it to him. Kelvin simply replies that he knows that Toraj is producing a crop which is very similar to rice that was found in his world, and asks for the permission to buy this crop from her kingdom. The queen seems surprised and asks why is he not asking for money, fame or riches, but Kelvin replies that he doesn't really care about all that stuff and would just like to have some rice for himself. The queen laughs at this and claims that he doesn't need to buy anything, as she will have his wagon loaded with a bunch of rice and if that ever gets over, he can simply write a letter to her, and she will send over more. Following that she organizes a small banquet for our heroes and they all eat a buttload of rice alongside some traditional Japanese dishes that they all enjoyed to their heart's content. Some days have passed now, and Kelvin has been staying at the castle alongside his party as the queen's guest. Ethel arrives in his room and has started creating a bunch of Japanese food, which everyone is impressed by as she has a rank cooking skills. He starts eating the rice balls when the queen also comes in to share, claiming that even her chefs can't create a rice ball as delicious as this one. She then asks Kelvin whether he would want to stay here in Toraj and work for her, but he refuses the offer kindly, claiming that they are adventurers and they usually don't work for anyone. The queen laughs and tells him that if he ever changes his mind, 
he is welcome to work in Torach. That evening, they all get ready to leave back for Parth when the queen tells them that they are going to use a special means of travel, and they go down into the dungeon to see a teleporting gate. She tells him that this is connected to the gate in Parth and that they will immediately reach there once passing through. Kelvin and his party bids farewell to the queen and pass through the gate to finally reach their hometown. The next morning, Kelvin sits down on the dining table while sipping his tea before telling Ethel that he has bought a house for them and they would be staying there from now on. They are all happy as they see the massive mansion for the first time and eagerly open the door to get inside. They also find the two slaves that they rescued in Torej called Ellie and Luca who would now be working as the servants of this mansion. Sira immediately rushes off to find the biggest room to herself, while Gerard goes into the dungeons to create a training room. Ethel runs off to find the kitchen, while Chloe seems to be happy with the lawn and wants to live there. Kelvin later reaches a room that has been converted into a total bathhouse and takes a long well-needed bath before collapsing on his bed for the night to get some sleep. Suddenly he hears Mel's voice who claims that he has collected enough experiencer, and Mana points that he can now summon her. Excited beyond imagination, he quickly gets off his bed and immediately chants a spell that creates a magic circle and through it descends the beautiful goddess Mel who looks just as pretty as my girlfriend. She asks whether he thinks that she looks good and he replies that he always wanted to clap some goddess cheeks before turning in for the night. The next morning everyone is greeted by Mel at the breakfast table but no one seems to recognize her till she reveals that she was summoned last night by Kelvin. Everyone is shocked to have a living goddess between them but they soon get used to her while she happily eats cookies made by Ethel. Kelvin asks whether calling her by her real name would be fine as she is a famous goddess, but she replies that a lot of people name their girls after the goddesses so it shouldn't raise any eyebrows. She then turns towards Kelvin and as a thanks for reincarnating her she gives him a reward by drawing a flower in the air with her magic that floats inside of his chest. She claims that he now has the grace of the goddess of reincarnation which will give him two special abilities that are not possessed by anyone else on this planet. Kelvin eagerly awaits for the reveal as Mel explains that the first ability is a defensive one which can be applied once a month which will protect him from an attack which would have taken his life otherwise. Kelvin is really happy about this as it now grants him a little bit of wiggle room for mistakes as even if someone surprise attacks him he will be safe. Mel seems to be relieved that he likes the ability before revealing that this is not even the main ability. And the main special ability that he possesses now is the power to summon his own heroes that shocks everyone including Kelvin. Later that day, Sira challenges Mel to a friendly battle in the dungeon training room that Gerard has set up and the fight starts. They both go all out since the start, attacking each other with their best abilities while going back and forth. Gerard calmly sits in the corner bench alongside Luca and watches the battle unfold, impressed by the skills of both the participants. Suddenly, Sira uses a special ability which creates a special gauntlet on her arms and rushes in to attack Mel while she uses another spell to reinforce herself and rushes in with a spear thrust of her own. The attacks clash and Mel's spear shatters on impact but Mel simply smiles while Sira realizes that her gauntlet has gotten destroyed as well. They fight some more before Sira is able to gain a slight upper hand and brings Mel down to her knees. Gerard applauds both fighters for an excellent performance while Sira helps Mel get up. After taking a bath, Mel decides to visit Kelvin who is still brooding over the way this world works. He is unable to understand why heroes need to be summoned in order to defeat a demon lord, as there must be several strong S-ranked adventurers that can band together and probably bring the demon lord down. Mel surprises him from behind and makes him deep throat a chocolate while he asks her why there is a need to summon heroes and isn't there a way to stop the demon lord from ever coming back. Mel explains to him that the reincarnation of the demon lord is a truth in this world which is more or less a natural order that can't be manipulated. It is a vicious cycle written in the destiny of this world that every couple of centuries later a new demon lord is born. She tells him that the demon lord cannot be identified as it looks like a normal demon but there are two special attributes that make him different. The first one is that the evil inside the demon lord automatically multiplies again and again to the point where no matter how kind the demon lord was in the beginning, by the time he starts ruling his personality will be changed into pure evil. The second most overpowered ability that he possesses is the skill to nullify any kind of magic. This really shocks Kelvin who asks how the hell are they ever going to defeat him if he can nullify all sorts of magic. Mel smiles and tells him that this is why the heroes are summoned from a different world as they are not from this world so the natural order doesn't apply to them, and their magic is fundamentally different from this world as well, which means that the demon lord can't nullify their magic. 
Kelvin asks whether this means that even his magic will affect the Demon Lord and Mel replies that it will. She continues that the title of heroes is simply given to these people as it gives the local people living in these war-torn areas a ray of hope when they hear that heroes are coming to save them. Kelvin still seems to be very skeptical about summoning someone from the normal world without their consent, and straight up plunging them into a world of monsters and demons where they will be forced to risk their lives. Mel seems to understand this and explains that he has two choices. He can either summon a person to this world or he can reincarnate them. The difference between them is that the people who get summoned are like the hero's party, living humans who are teleported to this world. But the people who are reincarnated are similar to Kelvin who got deleted by Truck Kun and are given a chance to start a new life in a different world. This makes more sense to him and he seems to be more willing to reincarnate a person to this world and giving them a second chance at life just like he got one. Later that evening, Kelvin ends up making up his mind and decides that he will reincarnate a hero to this world. Everyone assembles in the dungeons while Kelvin gets ready to use his special skill for the very first time. They all stand in a row while Kelvin calls all of his summons back. Ethel then gives him a shot of Russian vodka as he wants to summon Vladimir Putin himself. He then chants the spells and suddenly a huge magic circle appears on the floor. A huge amount of mana points are used during this so he sits down on a chair and drinks some tea like a posh British wanker while waiting for Putin to appear. He asks Mel whether he made a mistake or did something wrong. Mel calmly replies that he should just be patient as the person who is getting reincarnated seems to be choosing their skills among other things. He waits for some more time when suddenly Mel claims that the selection process is complete, and soon enough a shadowy figure appears from the magic circle. As soon as the dust clears up, Kelvin is a little disappointed to see that instead of Putin, some useless Chinese factory worker got reincarnated. This girl looks around confused and dazed but Kelvin calmly walks towards her and claims that she doesn't need to worry as she is safe. He then explains to her that he was the one who summoned her here and she immediately lights up, introducing herself as Rio and claims that she met an angel before coming here who told her that she is going to become a hero soon. Kelvin smiles and tells her that this is true and immediately she starts crying out of happiness and hugs Kelvin. She seems to be relieved to have a chance at life again and seems to be so tired that she ends up sleeping while crying. Kelvin looks at her adoringly but soon enough even he starts feeling incredibly drowsy as he has used almost all of his mana points to summon Rio. Later in the night, Rio wakes up from her slumber and is dazed only to remember that she has been reincarnated into a new world. She thinks about her last days in the hospital after she got hit by Truck Kun who was on a rampage and even the doctors were unable to save her and her life was taken away. She goes outside of the mansion and is extremely happy to see the beautiful night sky filled with twinkling stars. She starts running on the grass before falling over as she is still not used to running as much. Suddenly Kelvin appears and smiles at her claiming that he was reincarnated in this world the same as her. He claims that even he got deleted by Truck Kun and was summoned to this world but he doesn't have much memories of his previous life. He claims that even he was terribly confused at first as he had no friends or allies and was basically all alone in a completely new world but he ended up making a lot of friends in a short duration of time and soon this place became his home. He kept adventuring and fighting different monster and before he knew, he was upgraded to an rank adventurer in this world. Rio wonders why the hell is this grown man flexing on her but tells him that she always wanted to live in a fantasy world because she was a gamer who never touched grass or had any friends. So when Truck Kun decided to choose her as his next victim she was very surprised and oddly happy. She thanks him for summoning her to this world and Kelvin smiles before telling her that they both have black hair which is not very common here so Kelvin has told everyone that they are siblings from a faraway land called Alabama. She is happy to hear this and soon gets officially enrolled in Kelvin's harem and his party. The next morning, Kelvin takes all of his party alongside Ellie and Luca into the enchanted forest to a sort of picnic. Rio is beyond happy and is running around everywhere to see what is this world, while Ellie and Luca ask why are they here with them. Kelvin explains that he has put two golems at the gate to guard the house but he would still like them to know what combat feels like as if they are ever in trouble, they can defend themselves and won't be scared and helpless. Meanwhile, Gerard cuts down a monster, Chloe takes care of another one and Sira punches a tree for some reason. After they start gambling on a competition about who can hunt the most monsters first and goes deep inside of the forest. Meanwhile, suddenly Ethel tells Kay Elvin that she can feel the presence of a powerful stray monster coming near them. Kelvin tells Mel to take care of Luca and Ellie while he gets up to face the monster. The monster turns out to be a shadow wolf, 
who appears in front of them with its fangs showing, ready to devour them but as soon as it jumps over to attack. Kelvin simply uses his gravity spell that pushes him back to the ground and he is unable to move. Kelvin calmly moves towards it and then waits for its HP to go down a little before making a contract with the beast. The wolf immediately goes inside Kelvin's pokeball and is now one of his summons. After that he summons the wolf back again who is a total hit with the girls who immediately start hugging me. Suddenly Ethel exclaims that she can see Erd and his party coming this way in the forest. Soon Erd arrives and seems surprised to see Kelvin here. He asks what is happening and Kelvin claims that they are here for a small picnic. Erd tells him that their party recently got the opportunity of becoming rank B but they have to hunt down a lot of monsters in a specific time period in order to complete this challenge. Erd's entire party gets jealous at the fact that this wolf monster is getting more than they ever could but Erd tells them to control themselves. Kelvin introduces the girls to Erd's party but this just ends up making them jealous and they run outside of the forest while Erd tries to stop them. Some time later, Gerard, Chloe and Sira arrive back from the forest and claim that they saw Erd and his party in the forest. Kelvin explains that they are here for their exam and have to kill a bunch of monsters in the forest. Hearing this, a guilty look crosses all of them. Kelvin asks what the hell did they do while Ethel uses her magic to check for the presence of monsters and reports to Kelvin, claiming that she can't find a single monster inside the forest. Sira looks very guilty and smiles before explaining that they ended up killing all of them. Kelvin is horrified as now Erd won't be able to get a promotion so he rushes back to the town and apologizes to Erd, promising that he will talk to Leo and tell him what happened. Erd tells him not to worry about it before looking at him and his party and claiming that he thinks Clevin might be ready for his S-rank exam. The next morning, Kelvin and Rio wash the dog completely to make sure that he doesn't look as dirty as he was inside of the forest before Rio tells them that she can understand what the doggy is saying thanks to her special skill. Kelvin is surprised as he has never heard of this ability before but soon enough, Gerard calls Rio down to the dungeon in order to complete their sword practice. In the coming days, Rio practices with a sword every day while having fun fishing with Sira, exercising with Luca and adventuring on the doggy's back. She sleeps every day with the dog which gives Kelvin and Mel some time to bang it out when they want. One random night, Kelvin is woken up by sudden movement and meets up with Sira, Rio, and the doggy while the rest sleep. Gerard has been posted to guard their doors while Sira tells Kelvin that she thinks that a bunch of suspicious looking men have been surrounding their mansion during the night. Kelvin uses his magic to spot all of the men but notices that the highest ranking member among them is level 26, which is very low. Sira asks whether she should deal with them, but Kelvin tells her to stay and instead tells Rio to go out and deal with these weaklings alongside Doggy. He tells her that she will have to face a lot of humans in this world and this would be kind of a test to see how strong has she grown. Rio agrees to it and in return Kelvin gives her wall hacks and a special sword that he forged for her. She goes outside dressed in her armor alongside Doggy and gets ready for a fight. The first two guys that enter the mansion are easily dealt with as she kills one of them with her sword while Doggy takes care of the other one. Kelvin and Sira looks from a window as Sira comments that her swordsmanship can be improved but she still is skilled enough to learn the S-rank swordsmanship technique. Soon enough all of the people that infiltrated the compound have been dealt with as Rio's first actual mission is deemed complete and she celebrates with the doggy. Kelvin tells Chloe to clean up and Sira to make sure that Rio is not hurt as he is going out to deal with the enemies who are still hiding in the forest. He finds the leader of the ragtag group waiting for his men to come back but Kelvin calls him from behind, claiming that they are not going to come back from the mansion ever. The man seems to be shocked at this, but Kelvin gets the look of a molester on his face and deals with him his own way. The next morning Kelvin goes up to Leo who tells them that the people that he caught in his mansion are put in the prison and after interrogating them, he found out that all of them belong to the military nation Trison. Kelvin remembers that name because the fatty that he beat up a long time ago also belonged to Trison and asks, why the hell is that kingdom taking interest in him? Leo replies that Trison has always wanted to take control of the entire continent for itself and lately a lot of nearby kingdoms have been reporting that they are spotting a lot of Tigerison soldier activities near the border. He also tells Kelvin that he found out that the thieves that he captured in Torridge were working under the Trison government who is basically wanted to scout the entire area for viable entry points. Leo tells him that their neighboring kingdom Gon has the Beats King who is supposed to be the strongest person in the eastern part of the continent. And according to Leo, he himself has asked him to send Kelvin and his party to his empire. They travel through the forest inside of the carriage and all of them seem to be happy about this vacation sort of thing, while Kelvin seems a little stressed about his exam. 
he tells them that to become an S-ranked adventurer, a person must get approval from two rulers. He already got one from the Queen of Torach, and the King of Gon named Leon has promised him an approval if he can do a job. Everyone asks why is he worried then and he explains that the king is strong enough as he is also an S-ranked adventurer. So the only reason he could be calling Kelvin is because Trison is involved. Ethel and Sira tell him that they should all be very careful in this new area as they can be caught in a surprise attack. And as soon as they open their mouth, an arrow comes whistling in their direction and stops their carriage. Kelvin immediately gets out of the cart and spots a bunch of elven people up on the tree with bows aimed at them. He quickly takes out a letter and shouts that he has been personally invited by the King of Gone and he means no harm. Suddenly one of the village elders arrives who introduces himself as Nell and apologizes for their misconduct. He takes a look at the letter and realizes that it is authentic, claiming that they have been waiting for Kelvin and his party to arrive. He suddenly looks at Ethel and calls her Lumel, asking where the hell was she from so many years ago as all of them thought she was dead. Kelvin tells him that she is not Lumel, but Ethel, someone who was enslaved a long time ago. Nell takes them all to their treehouse inside of the forest, where they all sit down for some time. Nell apologizes for misidentifying Lumel, and claims that Ethel looks exactly like Lumel who was lost from them 20 years ago. Kelvin asks him to tell them what happened as it might be connected with Ethel as well and he starts speaking. He claims that up to 20 years ago, they were living in constant peace on this side of the continent, and were basically invisible to any other person outside of the forest but one unfortunate day, they were attacked by the Fire Dragon King, who is one of the kings of all the greater dragons. He told the villagers that one of the elves has disrespected him and he wants the elf to come in front. If he doesn't, the dragon vowed to destroy all of the village. The villagers had no idea what the dragon was talking about, and so the dragon started burning down the village without sparing anyone. He killed half the elves and burnt all of the village when suddenly one of the elves from the village named Lumel rose up and went in front of the dragon. She told the dragon to direct all of his anger towards her and to let the other elves live. The dragon took one look at her but claimed that she was not the one who disrespected him but he was an incel who never smelt a woman before so he takes the opportunity and tells Lumel that if she is ready to become his wife and let him clap those cheeks, he will let the rest of the villagers live. She agreed and he took her on his back before flying away. No one ever saw either of them afterwards. Kelvin asks that if everything is sorted then what's the problem now and Nell replies that a couple years later they found Lumel's dead body inside of the forest and are scared that the dragon might appear again to take revenge. Everyone looks at Ethel and Gerard asks whether it is possible that Ethel is the daughter of the Dragon King and Lumel. Mel however calls him an idiot and claims that size does matter and Dragon King is definitely a virgin. She also claims that Ethel is a half-elf that could only be made by a human and an elf, so this makes it possible that the dragon got cucked by a human and that's why out of anger, he killed Lumel. Kelvin tells them to write their fanfictions on Tumblr, while Nell claims that right now they are not facing the Dragon King though. The main problem is some enemies who have been infiltrating their villages and kidnapping elves every now and then. He claims that they were too weak to stop them and even the Gon soldiers were of no use. Kelvin tells him not to worry as he will deal with that problem now and asks Nell whether he could renovate the village till then as he really wants to be like Bob the Builder. Nell agrees and Kelvin gets ready to take this village to the future. Later that night when the moon is up in the sky, a bunch of soldiers from Trison start moving into the Gon territory alongside a huge horde of demon beats that they seem to be controlling using a special collar that their kingdom acquired. They seem to think that the Gon army is filled with cowards who decided to run away instead of fight but their commander tells them to keep moving and make noise as their game plan is to attract the attention of any kind of Gon forces and then eliminate them immediately. Suddenly one of them gets hit by an arrow which shocks everyone else as they are still far away from the elf village. But before they can realize what's happening, they all start falling like flies as a bunch of arrows are shot at them by someone that they are unable to find. We finally see that the arrows are being shot by none other than Ethel who is being assisted by Kelvin and the bow that he created for her. This bow can shoot from extremely long ranges and alongside that it doesn't make any noise when shooting. Kelvin has reinforced the village and made it into a fortress as he stands atop a watchtower and helps Ethel take them down. The walls have been made strong and high and are also covered by Mel's mysterious fog of war. Alongside that there is a massive moat outside the walls and the water around it is also bewitched by Sira's black magic. This altogether has made the village almost impregnable. Moreover, Gerard, Sira, Doggy, 
and Ryo have been stationed outside the ramparts to make sure that not even a single enemy is able to make their way inside the wall. Soon after that one of the enemy soldier runs back to their captain back at their camp with the news that they have been attacked and most of their units have been destroyed. The captain is furious and asks whether it's the army from Gon or Torach. But the soldier replies that it's only an adventuring party involving three girls and a wolf that has been destroying their ranks like nothing. The captain is unable to believe this but suddenly out of the woods, Ryo and Mel arrive and thank the soldier for leading them to their captain. The soldier runs away while the captain realizes that he needs to do something about this and decides to use his trump card. He takes out a shell and blows into it, creating a huge noise and suddenly from inside the forest, a giant monster wakes up. Ryo is amazed to see the size of this creature while Mel looks at it and assesses it to be an S-rank monster. She then looks at Ryo and tells her to deal with the monster alongside the doggy. At first Ryo seems to be a bit unsure but Mel claims that if she is able to do this then she should be considered a full-fledged adventurer. The captain is shocked to see that only a girl and her dog are running into the forest to deal with their strongest weapon. While the monster tries to punch Ryo into dust but they dodge the attack and start running up its arm. She jumps up in the air and takes out her sword to deliver a swift slash to the monster's head but the moment the sword touches the head, it shatters into small pieces. The monster immediately tries to hit her, but she quickly dodges out of the way. Unfortunately for her, the monster pursues and hits the ground which creates a lot of dust and stone to fly towards her, injuring her. She drops back to the ground and realizes that this could be dangerous and in order to defeat this beast she needs to hit him with a single clean slash and kill it. She starts running towards it once again alongside Doggy, while Chloe gives her two more swords to fight with. She runs up his body once again and alongside Doggy, delivers an incredibly powerful lightning fast slash that kills the monster. Before she could celebrate however, the monster transforms and gets up once again to assume its final form. Now this giant beast is burning with flame all over his body. The captain screams at him to finish the enemy, while Sira, Gerard, Kelvin and Ethel all watch from a distance. Ethel seems to be scared for Rio but Kelvin reassures her that she will do just fine. The monster tries to punch Rio to the ground, but she is easily able to dodge before running up his body once again. She looks at him one final time and says haste to la vista baby as she uses the same attack once again and completely destroys the beast. This scares the living crap out of the captain and his soldiers who run away as they can't believe that a small girl defeated their strongest monster. Kelvin seems to be proud of Rio as he and Ethel watch the scattered enemies from afar when suddenly K. Elvin senses an attack and creates a barrier around them, just in time to block an insanely strong attack. When the dust clears, Kelvin notices a guy flying in the air alongside his cronies, who congratulates Kelvin for blocking the attack, while he realizes that this enemy is really really strong. The man introduces himself as Clive and immediately notices Ethel while his eyes light up. He immediately tells her that she is the most beautiful person that he has ever seen and tries to use his charm magic on her. Before it could hit her though, Kelvin intercepts it and uses a blast to drive him back. Clive looks at him once again as if he was only a mere insect and asks what the hell is his problem. This totally enraged him as he tells Clive to back the hell off as no one touches any girl in his harem. Kelvin decides to play it safe and checks out his stats only to realize that Clive is level 91 and he seems to have a lot of abilities that you should only be able to get once you are reincarnated. He immediately shouts at him, asking if he was reincarnated, which shocks Clive as he realizes that Kelvin must be a very high rank person to know that. This makes him realize that Kelvin is reincarnated as well, but he doesn't seem to worry about it much. Kelvin knows that this could turn real ugly real quick, so he tells Ethel to run down the tower and hide herself somewhere. When Clive sees her running away, he tries to shout at her to stop but Kelvin immediately uses a massive gust of wind that blows Clive alongside his cronies away. He uses this time to disintegrate the tower and converts it into four giant lances, prepped and ready to attack. As soon as he spots Clive from the dust, he immediately shoots one of the lances that catch him off guard, but still his defense is so strong that the lance is blown away by it. Clive admits that it could have gotten scary if not for his superb defense magic, but Kelvin tells him that it is not over before shooting all four of the lances at him together. The lances attack him from four different directions but they all are stopped by Clive's magical barrier. Watching this, Kelvin decides to use even more magic blasts, but all of them are useless, while Clive laughs and claims that he is just wasting his time and energy over this stuff. He tells Kelvin that no physical or magical attacks can cross his barrier, and usually anything that touches it gets destroyed immediately, but his magic must be really strong and that's why these lances are still intact. 
After that, he simply blows all of them away before telling Kelvin to look behind. Suddenly Kelvin notices an attack coming his way but he immediately blocks it with his staff while using his other three lances to deostract the other attackers. Suddenly, Kelvin realizes that all of these girls seem to be charmed by him and are under his control, so he pushes all of them back. Clive tells him to admit defeat as he can never defeat him, but suddenly a super strong beam hits his barrier and completely destroys it. Shocked, he looks down to find Ethel aiming a bow at him. Meanwhile, Kelvin summons a bunch of golems and gives them the lances to even out the battlefield, but tells them not to kill the girls. The clash begins between them, leaving Kelvin and Clive to fight a one-on-one -on -one battle. Clive gets into the mood for battle and gets his staff out before they both start flying up in the air. Clive commends him for being able to keep up with him but Kelvin is ready to test who is faster and decides to challenge him. Clive immediately uses a magic blast at him, but Kelvin dodges before replying with one of his own magic beams which is blocked. They start fighting in the air, and what seemed to be a fight between two mages quickly transforms into a World War II dogfight as they both fly around in the sky, doing stunts while shooting a barrage of magic blasts at each other constantly. Clive seems to have the upper hand as he pursues Kelvin, but Kelvin is able to dodge almost all of the attacks pretty easily. Suddenly there comes a point when they start flying dangerously close to fighting golems, but Clive SDLL continues to attack and the stray blasts barely miss his underlings. Kelvin gets worried and shouts at him that he is going to hurt his teammates if he keeps doing that. But Clive doesn't give a shit and continues his barrage, forcing Kelvin to make a maneuver to make sure the girls are not harmed. Soon they both start ascending in the sky while Clive makes fun of him for caring so much for people in this world. He tells him that they don't belong from this place so why should they care about the people living here? This makes Kelvin mad as he thinks about the relationships that he has forged with the people in this world. They both get ready as Clive loads up his barrier and Kelvin decides to unleash one of his most devastating attacks. The clash happens in the sky and the results are devastating as a huge blast takes place as Clive realizes that his barrier was broken, while Kelvin loses his staff to this clash. Clive also gets a minor scratch on his face but like a girl just before her time of the month, he loses his shit over a small matter and starts screaming that he will destroy everything. He starts charging up his S-rank magic which is basically equal to a massive natural disaster, and the entire sky turns purple. Everyone watches him in the sky and even Kelvin realizes that this could have horrible consequences as a large amount of wind starts flowing up in the sky while all the villagers look up terrified. Kelvin descends on a mountain top and pulls out an entire new staff out of clothes ass and starts charging it with magical energy. It comes to a boil as Clive gets ready to destroy the entire area, but Kelvin's staff turns into a magical scythe and they both meet head on in a huge collision, but Kelvin decisively comes on top this time as he slices through the magic and completely nullfies it. He starts breathing hard and notices that Clive is in a much worse shape, lying on the ground with his legs chopped off. He moves towards the legless bastard with conviction in his eyes to end his life, but before he could deliver the final hit, someone saves Clive. Kelvin turns around to find a mecha-like monster carrying Clive, and another spectacled man who introduces himself as Tristan. He claims that he is one of the generals of the Trison army and he was the one who initiated and planned the attack on these villages. Kelvin moves towards him and realizes that this teleportation shit that he just witnessed is one of the special abilities of a summoner, and wonders who Tristan is. He tells Kelvin that they are defeated today and will be falling back, but also tells Kelvin that this is not the last time that he has seen them and that they would probably meet sooner than he expects. After that, he disappears and the battle is finally over. Everyone contacts Kelvin to ask whether he is okay, while he replies that he is fine and is floating back to the village. Ethel discloses the news of their victory to Nell, and he is beyond himself with joy as he realizes that the village has been saved and immediately tells the villagers to prepare a banquet for their heroes. Kelvin arrives at the ramparts and notices that Mel, Sira, and Rio seem to be having a race amongst themselves that Rio ends up winning. K. Elvin praises everyone for their contribution in this fight. Later that night they have a massive party after which Kelvin goes atop the hill to get some alone time but this clingy bitch Ethel follows him up and starts making small talk to him. Soon the rest of his party also arrives alongside a small elf girl who immediately hugs Kelvin. Soon she starts laughing maniacally before revealing that she is the King Leon of this kingdom. Everyone is super confused but he reveals that he has an item that lets him change his form at will. 
He claims that he used this avatar so that he can hide and watch Kelvin fight, and that he is proud to say that he passed the exam which means that Kelvin is now an S-ranked adventurer. He claims that soon they will have a huge ceremony in the kingdom where he will be awarded his rank and then there would be a small tournament between other S-ranked adventurers. This gets Kelvin's blood rushing and he gets excited to finally take part in an actual tournament soon now that the battle is delayed for some time. After that they all head down the hill to get a good night's sleep so that they are charged enough to take on any challenges they face further on. 